until he started talking, we had absolutely no idea what he was going to say or how it was going to go. And then as soon as he starts talking, just like he always does, every eye in the room is on him. And it was great. Hi, I'm Corey Baldwin. And I'm Dan Searle. We're back with a new Off the Beaten Path, a podcast for basketball coaches living in obscurity, working in obscurity, and even those who have made it out of obscurity. Hey, it's a place for storytelling, learning, connecting, and food for thought with a little food for the belly. And we got some good ones today. Introduce them, sir. We sure do. A very special treat on today's episode. We've got Ty Anderson, Michael Moynihan, and Patrick Moynihan, all great basketball coaches in their own right, but also grandsons of the legendary Lefty Drizel. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. How's everybody doing? Happy to be here. Excited to be a part of this. I'm not sure which one of us, if I'm in, in obscurity now, or have I made it out of obscurity, how obscure we are currently with this podcast. The, it's all pretty obscure. I think if you're on this show, yeah. <laughs> on this show, you're obscure. That's pretty much the time. Uh, as Patrick said when we were talking uh, pre pre show here, if we bring up certain names, we might lose listeners. Uh, we already <laughs> lost them. I mean, it, it happened right here. <laughs> so we're good to go. All right, Cyril, you 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 worked with Lefty for a little bit. So uh, you go ahead. You start us off here with some questions for these guys, and I'll jump in. Let's jump right in. I mean, I remember a couple of you running around with Atlanta Celtic jerseys coming through the Georgia State gym. Um, that was the highlight of our career, Dan. <laughs> so, you know, that was the highlight of our downhill career. downhill after that. You can stop it right there. Yeah. Okay, okay great podcast, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you on the next show. And now, just remember, that was on the second floor. Like, a lot of people don't realize what the Georgia State, quote, quote, arena is like. So, uh <laughs> That, 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 to me, is some of Lefty's uh, truest legend, is that he won on the second floor. On the second the floor. Yeah, and they had to take the steps down to the locker room. <laughs> he was not a big fan of that, that's for sure. But, hey, Mike, you mentioned that's some of the, you know, the best times, right? What are the memories that you guys have, just because of our six degrees of separation? What are those Georgia State, with your granddad being there, what are those memories it, it, at least two, three of you guys are Atlanta boys, right? So uh, yeah. what's, the, what's the ties? What's those images that come to mind? I mean, I remember my granddad getting the job and just being so excited that he was moving to Atlanta and just, just elated that he was going to be around us more often. And uh, I remember going to the games and being a ball boy, Pat and I, and Pat and I would play one-on-one -on -one at halftime and just like, you know, I watch games now and, you know, if there was little kids running around, they probably wouldn't be able to do the things that we were doing, but we probably got away with it because our granddad was left years out. So we got to run around. And I remember going to practices with them all the time. And uh, that was always a ton of fun. And just being around those guys, seeing guys like Rodney Hamilton, Shinar Long, Kevin Morris, Turk McGrath. I mean, those guys were like, they were like larger than life. So mm -hmm. there's some great, some great memories just being around the gym. So you mentioned that you get to shoot around at halftime and maybe because your grandpa's lefty Drizel. But that's part of this podcast, Off the Beaten Path. You guys have earned your way up to where you are now, and we'll go through that in a bit. Pat, what were you going to say? Sorry. I, I, think, I think part of the halftime uh, entertainment was the fact that Georgia State, not a lot of people realize this, when he took over, was the least winningest team in Division I. And so they didn't have anything planned. There was nothing out there. And so me and Mike just – we're out there being kids. And so the, the fans actually enjoyed it because it was better than nothing. But it was, uh, I mean, it, you look at Georgia State now, you walk in that arena and you see where the program is. You have no idea that back then it was just the bottom of the bottom. And, and it was in the transatlantic, known as the tacky tack. The tack. <laughs> Little Were you around for Georgia State uh, showings frequently every once in a while? Yeah, so when did he get the job? Was it 98 or 97, 98? 97. Mm -hmm. yeah, 97. So we moved, we didn't move down there until 
my family didn't move down to, to, and we moved to Athens, I think it was like 99. So the first couple of years, the extent of what, of me seeing the Georgia state games, they were, we were a lot closer to him when he was at James Madison where my family lived. So we were going to a lot more games and then Mike and Pat were down in Atlanta. Honestly, this has not a ton to do with basketball, but my first memory of driving down to Atlanta to see Mike and Pat and see, go to a state game was I always remember because we were driving down from Virginia, either Virginia or New Jersey, when on 85, when you get to Gaffney and you saw that big peach that looked like it had a hemorrhoid that you were about, uh, <laughs> that you were about, you were about three hours from uh, from getting to Atlanta. So I always like in my, you know, somewhere buried deep in my brain is associated with Georgia State basketball games is that peach in Gaffney, South Carolina. We, we could have a whole show on why is the peach in Gaffney, South Carolina, not in the peach state, but I'm right. glad that that's stuck in your brain as part of your uh, memories coming to Atlanta. So yeah, Ty, right. Did your family think Lefty got the job at Georgia? And that's why y'all moved to Athens? Were y'all missing the Yeah, form? right. I mean, what happened? Right. <laughs> right. I know, yeah. We, I know that when we came down, I mean, Mike and Pat, like me and Mike growing up, me and Mike were always best friends. And then Mike and then Patrick and then my younger brother, Walker, about the same age. So us coming down on family trips to see them was like, that was better than that was the best time all year uh, coming down to see them. And then when we moved to Athens and we were much closer, played on some of the same teams. We just got to hang out a lot more. And a lot of times that was for us coming into to Atlanta and parking in that little uh, that little bitty staff parking lot back there with who was the guy that – Dexter let you in. Dexter was Dexter. down there. We would pull up and Dexter was like, yeah, I got a spot for you. And we're like, how are we going to get out of here? I don't see this. <laughs> so, yeah, that was – I mean, honestly, Mike, Mike's kidding around the high. That was, a, that was where our careers peaked. But – that is like the best. I tell people all the time that of all the, the ways that I've been involved in basketball, my favorite is as a fan. And mm. as a fan of granddad teams, I, mean, I remember just like in tough losses, sobbing my eyes out as a little kid after some of those losses. And, and then after the wins is being as happy as I've ever been in my life. And uh, so as a fan, it, it, meant as much to me as any job I've or, or team I've ever played on. Interesting. Tony Watkins was talking about being a fan for his Woodward school where he graduated winning the championship versus him coaching. So question on the fan and your granddad's games, Ty, Mike, and Pat, what is one of those games that you remember for better, for worse, a win, a loss, but what is one that sticks in your mind over the years? I got so so I got three of them that just vividly I remember. Uh, two of them being the uh, A Sun Championship games. One when they beat Troy at home to go to the tournament. That was unbelievable. I remember that with the the crowd. I've never seen an environment in Georgia State's arena since then like that. Like it was unbelievable. Um, the other one was losing at Central Florida. Um, and it, it, people don't think about it now. Central Florida was in the A Sun back then. I mean, you you never you don't think about that. They've come a long way. But um, losing at Central Florida, and then the last one, I, I remember listening to him play, and I was young. They're playing Creighton, and I didn't know who Creighton was. I didn't realize Creighton was a you know really good basketball school, and they're playing against a guy named Kyle Corver, mm -hmm. and so. This was the year they, they went to the NCAA tournament. They beat um, Wisconsin and then lost to Maryland. And so I'm like, God, oh, they're going to beat Creighton. They're, they're definitely going to beat Creighton. And so I'm listening to it on the radio because games aren't broadcast on TV. I'm listening to it on the radio and we lose to Creighton. I'm, I, I about lost my mind at the house. I was like, how do we lose to Creighton? That's unbelievable. How do we lose that game? So those are three right off the bat that just <laughs> stick in my mind. What about you, Mike? For mine, it was easy, man. The NCAA tournament when they got against Wisconsin when I was in middle school. I mean, that was like – I remember being in the computer lab and just pulling up the game and watching it. And, I mean, it was like the, the coolest thing ever, man. I mean, for him to win that game and the next one would be, you know, playing against Maryland, which, I mean, I wanted him to win that game more than I wanted to win any game in my entire life that I've coached and played in anything. That was the game, man. And that was the one that I wanted more than anything. But – those two games definitely stick out. I mean, every game, just looking back as a kid with my family, 
Like you knew that the temperature in the room as a family for the vacation, anything, if it was a loss, like you're going to have to be on your toes and not do anything stupid, make too much noise and figure it out. Like you wanted granddad to win so we could all just party and have a bunch of fun and stay up late and watch movies and eat candy and eat good food and pizza. And if we lost, we were all going to bed by nine 30. So like, it was a big deal, man. We wanted granddad to win as much yeah. as possible. But those two tournament games, those were the ones for me that really stand out. That's what my, uh, my mom is a, is a Presbyterian minister. And she says a lot, she's included in a couple of her sermons, how, what it was like growing up where like, like Mike said, the temperature in the house was determined very directly by whether or not the ball went in the basket or not. Mm. And uh, yeah. So Again, therapy will probably help with that in a few years, but that that takes me back. I mentioned it. We had uh, Justin Young and, and Kevin Young, and we talked about families being in ball, and it always takes me back. I got to say it a second time to the Hoosiers scene where the girls telling Gene Hackman why she didn't like basketball was because her brothers played, and after every game, win or loss, you stayed up all night reliving yeah. it, you know, no matter what. Even, even the win wasn't enjoyable because you had to relive the whole thing all night right and the loss the same way yeah. um, that's, that's that's tough when you're in a, I think a family knows it you know coaches always remember losses uh regular fans only remember the wins yeah but when you're involved like you guys with that much involvement with your granddad I'm sure yeah some of those losses come across a lot a yeah. lot more well let's transition in we're going to talk a little bit about how you guys got into coaching I know uh obviously your granddad a hall of famer and we didn't want to uh, not speak of that. But we do want to talk. All three of you guys are very successful. Uh, Patrick, you're the youngest, correct? Yeah. All right. So you'll, we'll let you go first because you probably never got to go first in anything back back home, right? <laughs> so you can go first. And, and you, uh, obviously, your career is, is just blossom. I'm going to let you kind of tell your path, you know, start where you played high school, college, and, and then kind of go from there. But uh, we know the story, but people listening may not. So tell us a little bit. So I uh, played at Centennial High School and um, really uh, when I was a freshman, I was like five, six, one fifteen. I was just tiny. Um, and so I grew after my, I grew my junior year. So now I'm like six, five. And so I, I really blossomed late. Um, and then I had the opportunity to go to North Georgia I uh, went to North Georgia, played up there, was redshirted a year. So I finished, I, I, I did five years up there. Um, after college, I decided to coach at Buford High School with my old high school coach, um, Alan Whitehart. And then that summer, I did AAU ball with the Atlanta All-Stars for a summer. I uh, got lucky, got a GA spot at um, North Alabama. I did two years up there as a graduate assistant. And then I was offered a graduate assistant position again down at Troy University. So I took that spot. We uh, went to the NCAA tournament that year, won 22 games. Uh, prior year, they had won nine. So it was like the biggest turnaround in uh, Troy history. Um, and then I was lucky to get the assistant position at Presbyterian College. And so spent two years there. And for people who don't know Presbyterian College, they're the Blue Hose. Um, that's that's their actual mascot. And they had never had a winning season in Division One. We took over a team that won like three games. And we had 11 wins the first year, 20 the next year. And Coach Kearns got the opportunity to come to App State. And I was lucky to come with them. So we had a good year last year, won 18 games, trying to build on that as well. But <laughs> something that sticks with me, uh, I was on the road with uh, George Brooks, Mike's uh, staff member. And he go, he looks at me, he goes, you and Mike ever get anything done uh, without your grandfather? Because <laughs> my first opportunity was with Bobby Champagne, who was an assistant at Georgia State. And then uh, Mike's real first opportunity at Division One was at Troy. And he did a great job. And so when I was looking to make the jump, Coach Cunningham asked if I'd be interested. And so we made that work out. And so George Brooks always busts our chops about that. 
but you made the most of it, right? And you mentioned <laughs> Cunningham, Phil Cunningham, who was a long time assistant with Lefty, um, brought you guys in, but you've earned your stripes along the way, right? So how yeah. about you? How about you, Mike? What's your Hey, hold on before before we go to before we go to Mike, one of the things that one of the times that I remember loving being a fan the most was the NCAA tournament run that Pat was just talking about when they were playing in the Sun oh, Belt championship in New Orleans, yeah. like kind of on a whim, Mike's season was over. I was a coach in high school at the time and my season was over and Mike had just gotten to Atlanta and me and Mike and my brother Walker just kind of last minute hopped in a car and drove to New Orleans to watch them win that championship. I think we stayed with one of Mike's friends that night. <laughs> uh, but that was a, that was a great, that was a great, uh, time as a fan right there yeah that was it was I mean, awesome right there, like like that game watching them win that championship knowing phil cunningham and marcus grant and ben fletcher and like all those guys on staff like phenomenal people knowing that they really needed to win that you know in, in order to in order to be there the next season and like i mean it was like i mean it was nut cutting time oh and, yeah and they pulled it out man and they pulled it out in a big time fashion and it was like for that to happen, for Pat to get to go to the tournament, I'm just so proud of him. And just to see Coach Cunningham, like nobody works harder that I've been around, not even close, than Phil Cunningham. Like that guy is a robot. And so for him to go to the tournament as a head coach of Troy, like nobody deserves that more than he does. And so he, uh, uh, there was a part, <laughs> there was a moment in that season. We had just lost to uh, South Alabama at home. And it was the second time we lost him. So we got swept by South Al. Next day, he pulls us into the, like, staff meeting room. And we sit down. And he goes, there's probably five games left in the regular season. He goes, well, guys, uh, if the season were to end today, we'd all be looking for a new job. He goes, but we got five more games. Let's figure this thing out. We got a good team. And, uh, man, give him credit. He God, I love out. that. Don't you love that? Yeah. <laughs> we won. We won the next – we won the last – four or five going into the tournament, had momentum. And we just had a good draw with teams that we had either beaten or played real tough. And, uh, and it was, it was a great run. And then for my family to be there after we won and be on the floor with us, I don't know, did y'all get a shirt? Y'all might've gotten a shirt. <laughs> I, don't think you got us a Pat. I don't think you got us a shirt, Pat. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> got the memories. Yeah. I'll tell you, uh, I followed that team pretty good. A, a kid that played for me was on that team. Danny. Yeah, that's right. And, he's, and uh, I followed that team pretty good. But uh, one thing that's kind of neat was y'all played Duke in the first round, right? Yeah, Jason Tatum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Up at Greenville. Yeah, it was, uh, that, was, that was unique. That was, that was a cool experience, too. What Coach K that, never Pat? said anything to his players. All he ever did was yell at the officials. Entire game. 40 minutes. Work and work. Never him. said. I don't even think he called a play. Just yelled at the officials the entire time. Cunningham was 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 worked up about that. He's like, he's got to stop talking to them. He's got to. He's like, at some point. <laughs> yeah, hey, good career move, Pat. Let's criticize Coach K here on uh, on on podcast. Good job. Pat, listen, yeah, Pat, Coach K hey. didn't even know who he was playing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was going to give Pat a lot of credit because everywhere he's went, it seemed like didn't win until. You know, and he kept moving up, but now he's criticized Kate, so his career's over anyway. <laughs> Mike, Mike, since you didn't criticize Kate and you still got a chance to coach in this business, tell us where you've been. Yeah, I mean, you know, similar. I uh, went to Centennial, obviously, grew up playing for the Celtics and uh, played with them till I was, till I was 15. I ended up playing with the Atlanta All Stars my 17 and under year. And the only reason I got invited, I talked to Coach Moore about this all the time, was because um, Coach Miller was really trying to get Ty on the team. And it was the only reason, was trying to get Ty on the team. And uh, so he was like, yeah, sure, you can bring your cousin. <laughs> and uh, and so so he brings me, and uh, I end up having a couple good practices. And, and Coach Miller's nice enough to put me on the team and, uh, you know, play with him that year. So it was a great time. And then I, I went to Georgia State as a walk-on. And, uh, you know, just was really, really wanted to prove that I could make the team and play and ended up starting the last six games of my sophomore year. Actually started at Jacksonville State for a game and got a win. 
had like had like 16.6 assists. Check out those record books, Ty. See if you can pull that. <laughs> yeah, up. I'll look that up. Yeah, look that up tomorrow. See if you can find that. Media guides. Yeah, yeah. Pull that old media guide. And uh, you know, went there and um and had a great time. And uh Rob Barnes, I got the job that year. And uh I that was when the economy got really bad and I had to leave and get a scholarship somewhere. That was two thousand eight. And so I went to North Georgia and Pat and I went there together. And um, it's one of those, you know, transfers in the Peach Belt, like Coach Baldwin was talking about earlier. And I had a great career there playing with Coach Faulkner and Josh Travis. They're awesome. And uh, loved it. Wouldn't trade my time in Delano for anything. And then I got into first coaching jobs with Alan Whitehart at Buford High School as well. Um, his first year at Buford, we lost in the state championship to Malcolm Brogdon. Um, I think you guys both got – You got, didn't, did you guys both lose in state championships by like 30 pieces? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. both we both <laughs> lost in the state championships and got like dubbed big yeah, time. Blasted. Yeah, blasted. Yeah, at halftime. Dubbed the big time. The end of the game, you already knew it was over, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, we had played we had played Malcolm three times. This is our third time playing Malcolm that year. The first two times we lost by one point each time, and so we go into that third game thinking that we got it figured out, and we got blown out by forty. Eddie Martin, pretty good coach. Look him up. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I was in the same boat when I was coaching at Westminster. We lost to Brogdon three times in the same. Yeah, and he's like, man, you know. So good. I go from there. I go to North Georgia as a graduate assistant, and then um, actually got to coach Pat for a year. It was okay. We needed better players, uh, <laughs> and then and then I went to Young Harris that next year as a full time with Pete Herman, who knew my granddad. You know, they had gone back. Granddad getting me another job, right? And uh, and then went to Troy. I wanted to get division one video coordinator is great coach Cunningham got there and like man what I learned from coach Cunningham is just one of the hardest working most organized person I've ever been around and like there's tools that he taught me that I use to this day and um yeah I mean he's he's the best he works out every morning at 7 a.m and if you don't work out with him he's not going to buy you lunch that day if you do work out with him he'll buy you lunch so like you always got to work out with coach Cunningham in the mornings or else he will there will be a lot of judgment passed um and then we go to, I go to George Mason with Paul Hewitt uh, as director of ops. It was our last year there. And, um, you know, Chris Kreider was, was nice enough to get me connected to Coach Hewitt and give me that job. And Oh, Kreider helped with that? I was wondering. Well, I, I might have helped you with Kreider that. Helped, he, Kreider helped you with that, huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 Chris Kreider. Yeah. And, then, and then my granddad also coached a guy named George Rabling who George Raveling and Paul Hewitt happened to be close to. So mm -hmm. there you go. That worked out. Hey, did Paul Hewitt ever coach any of y'all? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I'm sure I had nothing to do with that one. <laughs> uh, Cheers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's, let's, let's thank Ty. I, let, let's be honest, though. Ty actually hurt me. I, 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 I took like a 20% pay cut. So just, but yeah. He hired you despite that. Family. Yeah. And so we go from George Mason to uh, we, we get fired at the end of the year and uh, and I'm out of a job and um, Julio with the Atlanta Celtics connects me with coach Hewitt. I mean, with coach Halland, he gets me an interview and, you know, him and Corey are obviously really close. Him and Corey's dad are really close. Carl and uh, gets me an interview. And he offers me a job at the final four. So I went through as a video coordinator and then, director of ops for two years and then went to UNC Asheville for a season. And then, um, spoke to coach at the end of the year. And, um, you know, we thought we were going to be good. Didn't want to deal with the transition in that ops position. So I came back, but I would have never been at Mississippi state if it weren't for Julio coach PJ, the Atlanta Celtics growing up playing with Javaris uh, I mean, like they, they are the reason I'm here and they're like phenomenal people. And I mean, it's, yeah, it's, that's, a, that's how I got to Mississippi state. It's because of I, I had some last names there for people who may not be able to connect when you're talking about Carl and uh, Carl McRae, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, Julio Smith. And so, you know, those guys right there, they're, they're the reason I'm here. So um, yeah, that's it. All right. So now let's go to the less conventional tie yeah my story's not that interesting the bottom line is we all played for ben miller and the atlanta all-stars and that's why we are where we are 
I, I I don't know that he'll listen to this. I'm not sure he knows how to pull up podcasts, but uh, yeah, that that we got to we got to give him some love. I will say I don't get connected with uh, Dustin Kearns if it weren't for Ben Miller. So, so yeah, everybody had some AAU time. Yeah, and yeah. I don't go to North Georgia when I'm leaving Georgia State if it's not for Ben Miller. I mean, he's the one who he organized that whole thing. I'll give you a funny story when you came to. North Georgia, it was my going into my second year at Truett. And we had uh, organized a thing with David Archer where D2s, NAIs, and JUCOs could play at Truett. And it was like a round robin, but you wasn't coached. You kind of came in and played with your team, but the coaches couldn't coach you. They could only watch from the stands. And I sat up there with Chris Faulkner, and he, we played you guys, and he was showing, uh, hey, that's that white guy right there. He's Lefty's grandson. He's a transfer from Georgia State, da, 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 da. I said he's not very good, you know those type things. It was, it was you know, no. Nah, <laughs> but, but yeah, so you played in the little uh, tracker box. Uh, Mike was big time. I, Mike, Mike ended up having the best, the best college career of any of us. Yeah. Like it, he was for first at his last year, or the last like five. How many games did you start your last your last year at Georgia State? Six. Started his last six games and was going toe to toe with with. Uh, the point guards in that league who was in there eric Maynard, you were playing against and and then when you went yeah. to north georgia dude you you were going to be player of the year and then he tore your ACL, and you still were you were still got votes for player of the year even though you missed the last five games he was, he was voted year, first team all conference and he missed first the last team all conference games. missed the last half of the conference schedule with a with a bum knee i mean he, mike mike was big time i like it all right ty give us yours you're being Humble over there with your Yankee uh, shirt. I just want to go on record as saying this is my favorite podcast. <laughs> hey, you're a player, Mike. You're a player. Thanks, guys. Yeah, He's just going to replay this anytime. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Ty. Even though we're mad that you're wearing the Yankee shirt, I'm going to bring it up again. Us all being Atlanta guys. I guess that's why you lived in Athens. Yeah. All right. So go ahead and give us. So, so you play at uh, Oconee? Or North Oconee. You played at Oconee. Oconee. Yeah, I played at Oconee in, yeah. uh, in, in Athens, or near Athens. And uh, and then went to Georgia Tech. Uh, I would say I played there, but that that's really given the word play a lot. Too much uh, lateral lateral movement there. <laughs> it uh, I didn't play a whole lot. Uh, but I was there with, with uh, Coach Hewitt, who is one of the best – men that I've ever known great coach uh learned a lot from him that would not have wouldn't have done anything differently wouldn't have picked any of the you know smaller schools d2 schools that I could have gone to and played wouldn't have wouldn't have traded it for for what I got at Georgia Tech and um and then went down there went down there to Waycross and uh became a swamp fox for life and now that that was uh, – that was – I learned – and I'm not kidding. When I – when I, the three years that I've been a head coach, uh, I probably took more, especially defensively, from – I mean, I took in from, from you, coach, than, than anybody else, especially because, like, the, your boss – I had him come in and do defensive clinics, Coach G, with all of my teams. And even if we didn't do things the exact same way, uh, I loved – getting his enthusiasm and his intensity and attention to detail. The same thing that I got from you. I mean, you remember when I first got a head coaching job at South Gwinnett, I came down and spent a day or two with you and just talking about our press and uh, half court principles and different drills that you did and ways that you taught it. Uh, yeah. yeah that, 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 was nice. that was nice. You come down, we had a little Mexican trailer. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That, that was high level. <laughs> and and uh, makes a note it. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, did a lot of film work and stuff. That was good. That was good. But you did a year with Hewitt, right? Like after you played, wasn't you kind of like a student assistant, kind of a manager? Yeah, yeah. That was just a generous. Uh, he just liked having me around to talk politics. Mm -hmm. That good. was a. Uh, I, I hurt. I, I hurt my knee or ankle or back or something. I I don't know. But I, I wasn't gonna play my my last year, and uh, so he kept me around. I was. Somewhere between a GA and a manager, uh, and would would 
talk politics with, with coach. <laughs> One thing when you came down here that uh, I can tell, because I know, you know, obviously you, you worked here with me, but it was the year you were here, we were still living in the duplexes. We didn't have dorms. Yeah. And that year the water was out on anybody that lived in the bottom. You could only get cold water, I think. Yeah, either the water – well, so down the street yeah. at the one that I lived in, we only had cold water. Mm -hmm. But then up the street, they just had too much water. Their living room flooded like three times a week. <laughs> so I just remember you would come in every morning, and I would be doing some work, and I'd think, man, Ty is a go-getter, man. He well, the, hey, taking a shower. I had to – I had to get the hell out of there. I, I showered every morning at the at the office. You remember that in that little locker room? I figured it out about two weeks in after I was praising you being such a hard worker, and then I, <laughs> I didn't get in there. The shower. It had nothing to do with work. <laughs> I had to get in there and use the shower. And then the other thing I remember about uh about Waycross, it's easy to tell the shitty stories about Waycross, but I love Waycross. I mean, the, the, the kids that we had, I love the Juco kids that we had because they were, they were just hungry. Mm -hmm. And you had them coming and going. You had, you know, you had the kids that didn't have other options and they were, they were willing to, you know, work their butt off to get somewhere. And then, you know, you were helping them get, get to their, their four-year school. Uh, I mean, it's amazing that the, the trust, in the short amount of time, the trust that you are able to, to garner from those, those kids on a yearly basis. Uh, but I, I remember we lived, those duplexes were on Sage Street. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, so every time that I would come up the, the street and turn off of Sage Street, I'm not kidding you, for a whole year, there was a toilet sitting in the, in the, in the front lawn of this, <laughs> this house that you had to turn down. And I never I always wondered, I thought maybe it was just a piece of art. This guy was maybe some sort of avant-garde art collector. Corey, did you ever, when did you work for Lefty? Because that's the only way Ty would have gotten a job with you. Right, right. Hey, believe it or not, I didn't even talk to Lefty. I, I wanted to call him just so I could get a Lefty story. But uh, I actually, when, when I hired him, it was uh, a lot of mutual people. You know, uh, you're, you being one, Searle, I vouched for him. Uh, even though you probably didn't even know him. You just knew he was Lefty's grandson, probably. But uh, Justin Young was another one. And uh, you were about to go work at uh, – now, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I don't want to mess you up. But I think you were going to go to work with South Cobb and be, like, community coach. Yeah, Coach Moultrie over there. Moultrie yeah. and Moultrie. God, I love Coach Moultrie, man. Yeah, he had yeah. called me and told me, like, he's a, you know, man, no-brainer. Uh, and you came down. I'll never forget it. We had a situation where an assistant was with us and then – wasn't able to be with us and it was almost October or maybe it was even early October. So we're practicing and Ty comes down with uh, Chris Faulkner or Josh maybe on, isn't that right? Don't you come down with them? I think. And then yeah. you, you drove with, you know, separate, but you came down, they were recruiting that day. Yeah. Watched the practice. And uh, I was impressed. He came in a suit, you know, and a lot of guys know they're going to a Juco. They're going to show up. And I've had a guy before come to an interview in a, in a baseball hat and tennis shoes. So it was nice to see, you know, he came in a suit. So I knew he at least was trying to impress. Uh, and then we went and ate steak at Applebee's and uh, yeah. he ordered the rarest steak I've ever seen anybody eat in Applebee's history of a way cross. I think they had to like, uh, they were about to put it on and he said, no, nah, that's good. You know, that's good there. They hadn't even put it on the thing yet. Yeah. But after I threw up a couple of times, we had a good conversation, and uh, that was good stuff. Hey, speaking of suit, you know, <laughs> Granddad has been calling. Granddad has given Patrick and I, or Patrick and me, a couple of suits uh, that he that we've had to, you know, I've gotten fat now, so I don't really have to get them altered very much. Patrick has to get them altered a little bit. But the Mike, I don't think Mike fits into them. Mike's too, a little, little too small, but – they don't he, fit me either. He thinks they fit me. They don't fit Well, me. they you wear them. I know you wear them. I've never worn them. He's yeah, on a search. Him. He's, on, <laughs> he's, on a, he's on a search right now to find the, the game that's been airing on ESPN a few times, the, the first time that Carolina lost in the Dean Dome. Uh, now he's on a, a, an all-out search for this tan jacket, and he calls us every day. I'm like, Granddad, I don't have that jacket. Like, I know I gave it to you. I know you got it somewhere. Like, I don't have it. I don't, I don't, I just don't have it. 
What about the Sooty War when they played Georgetown when he was at Georgia State? That was well. So Searle got to tell Searle was first hand on that. I was on the bench for that one, and that was that was a special moment. Georgia Dome, Georgetown coming to town, little Georgia State hitting the big time, and he had that suit tailored specifically for the occasion. A little gray vest and the yellow sleeves underneath. That was that was a big time suit. Got got plenty more attention there. That I've happen. tried I've tried to track down photos of it. In fact, I called. I think we were talking about it on our group chat uh, a few months ago. I tried to call Granddad, Grandma, find a picture of it, see if he had it. Couldn't track it down. And it's not on the internet either. It's not. It's nowhere. It's Couldn't find it. Who, who would have wrote for the AJC then? Would it have been uh, what's the guy that gets everybody fired? Mark Bradley? Would he have wrote something about it? He may I have. don't know. I feel like hard. if anybody have it, have it, it'd be Dave Cohen. That's, yeah, right. That's yeah, right. Dave. anybody That's had true. It. Dave, yeah, Dave would have that. Mm -hmm. Man, that got a lot of airplay. Like that was even on Sports Center. You know, it was. I remember that. That's crazy. Yeah, he had like a pimp suit. He walked. I think he had a cane and a top hat. It's unbelievable. <laughs> All right, Ty. So you leave Waycross, and it was so miserable working for me that you had a job offer to go to Lee university but you decided you just wanted to get the hell out of coaching and the united states and everything else that yeah i was trying to get out so when i when i turned down that job at lee with tommy brown a couple years later mike 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 did the same thing mike and a couple years later i work with him <laughs> <laughs> that guy hates us that wasn't my fault. That was Andre Morgan's fault. He convinced me, good recruiter, whatever. He got me to go to Young Harris. No, but no, but really, I mean, my Tommy was awesome, dude. He's like the greatest. Pat, have you talked to him lately? I talked to him in the beginning of all this, like the uh, the pandemic and everything. He spoke to my team. He does this thing now, be the thumb or whatever, and he teaches everybody that there's five types of personalities, and they each match what your finger. And he has a story. It's pretty good, actually. Somebody ought to go follow him and get him to speak to their team. I'm not going to try to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get him out here. <laughs> but the thumb is the best one. That's who you want to be, the thumb. Be the thumb. Be the thumb. Be and, the of course, thumb. the middle yeah. finger, you already can t tell who that's going to be. Right. That's a bad player. You know, that's F you. Everything's uh, personal. Anyway, it's pretty good. So, so you go where? Cambodia, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. I went, uh, went into the Peace Corps. And uh, for a little over two years, I was in Cambodia. And when I came back, I worked with, uh, for a summer, worked with Coach Miller. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to tell the story about when you first get to Cambodia and you, you were telling the girl that you were having the house you were living in. I know the story. You got a bad word in it, but you can, we, we'll beep it out or whatever. You got to tell that story. That's classic to me. <laughs> All right. So, the language barrier was 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 a big real yeah definitely real i mean i was i was living i was living in a very rural area about 50 miles from the next no about 30 miles from the next uh english closest english speaker and uh so you know you didn't have a, a whole lot of time i mean you didn't have a whole lot of choices but to learn a language and uh so for the first eight weeks you're there, you go through training and you're there with other volunteers that are in your cohort and before you go to your permanent site. So during that time of training in my language classes and everything, I'm putting together my little little things that I can say, little phrases that I can say that I know I can say. I've mastered them. I know what they mean. Now, I might not be able to hear anything yet, but I, I know I can communicate these couple things. So one of the things was I wanted to explain to when I got to my permanent site, my host family in a, in a little town in a Posat, Cambodia, and this woman who I became super, super close with, uh, as my, was my host mom. Uh, she didn't speak any English. And so I get there and I'm telling her, I came here to help the United States government sent me here to help you. I can help you in the kitchen. I can help you around the house. I can help you in the market. I can help you with the kids. Any way that you want me to help you, just ask. So 
in Kamai, the word for help is chui. The word for is choi, which is very, very similar. So I'm getting the response from her like, oh, no, 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 I don't want any of that. I don't need any help. <laughs> I'm good. Don't need any help. And so it wasn't for another like probably four or five weeks that I'm now meeting with a with a tutor who speaks a little bit of English and he's helping me out. And I'm like, why, why would I tell my host mom that, uh, you know, I, you know, if she needs any help, I can help her. And uh, he's like, oh, I'll tell you exactly why. So we had a we had a big we had a big laugh over that, but uh, you know I was I was telling her you know the U.S. government brought me over here to. Oh. I can yeah, see. Yeah, so I go back. All right. So you go well. Back to Cambodia. You work with the Atlanta All Stars. You're back with with your boy, uh, yeah. Benny Miller, living yeah, with Coach Miller. And uh, yep, that. and then from there, uh, what I do? Oh, I went went to North Georgia. Mm -hmm. and uh you were the only one that hadn't been there yet so you had to go yeah i had, well, I had to go yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh i went there for, for the a line. year oh. yeah and then and then i got into high school and i was a uh a head a head coach in high school for three years before uh joining staff at jacksonville state where i'm at now now not so fast you coached at a high school which lewis williams played at of course he wasn't there when you coach there, but same high school he played at. Sure, yeah. Let's let's name drop as much as possible. I went yeah, to uh, yeah, yeah. South Gwinnett. Yeah. And uh, was there for two years, and then I spent a year at a small private school, Holy Spirit. And in, who played uh, there? What was the guy? In Atlanta. Pretty good player. Yeah, well, I had I had several good players. One was uh, Anthony Edwards, who, God willing, will be a be one of the top three draft picks coming up here in a few months. So that's awesome, man. So. So now you, you've you done what everybody says don't do. You did high school as a head coach, and yet you're still able to get back in the college ranks. And not, maybe not everybody doesn't say it, but a lot of college guys will deter people from doing that. Yeah. But now you end up – now you're at Jacksonville State with uh, Ray Harper, and, and uh, you're the basketball ops guy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mike made that happen, really. Mike had a – yeah, Mike, Mike helped well, me you out. Credit him, a, even though he didn't credit you. Yeah, well, I'm not very selfish. Okay, I try not to be very selfish. Okay. Mike had Mike had a uh, Mike had actually set me up to get that this same job three years ago, and I turned it down. Or I don't know if we ever got there, but I went to took a head job in high school instead, and so it just got lucky. Worked out. It was that easier way. setting them up the first time. What was the connection? How did that come about? Uh, Chase Richardson is an assistant at Jacksonville State. Good guy. And, uh, yeah, man, they were looking for an ops, and I was like, got to hire time. The guy built a self-sustaining economy in Cambodia. He can definitely do hotels. <laughs> Might not know the language, but he can definitely help out over there. Yeah, right. so I think he'd be a good hire. You mentioned hotels and the, the role of the ops guy. Tell us, uh, for listeners who don't necessarily know that, how you guys have adapted from coaching on the floor to that – basketball ops and all of the responsibilities that come with that the kind of behind the scenes guy well i'll let i'll let patrick go i'm gonna say patrick or mike go i've been talking too long but i'll say this i didn't i completely underestimated how much i would miss coaching mm. like i knew i'd mentally prepared and everything i'm not gonna be coaching and i'm not just talking about going from being a head coach to i'm just talking about like the nitty-gritty on the ground floor, on the court, sweating with your guys. I missed that so much and didn't – did not anticipate that. I could see that. Ty, Ty was one of the best I had. I've had some good assistants that have moved on, but he was one of the best I had to do individual workouts. He was real good at it. Uh, so, I could see you – and you enjoyed it. So, I could see you missing it. Patrick, yeah, I missed you it. ever an ops guy, Patrick? I know, I know you – you're no, not – No, I was um... – you know, GA at, at Division Two, you're essentially an assistant coach because you only have one assistant. So I was doing everything, and then GA at they they made me a GA instead of a video coordinator at Troy because it allowed me to work the guys out. So mm -hmm. I was always working them out. So I've I've never done been that. lucky to never have to go through that. Um, about you, Mike, because you you're doing it now. Hubert High School, North Georgia, Young Harris, and UNC Asheville, Short stops. 
Yeah, I know that, but like being an ops guy, you're an ops guy now. What what are some of those challenges? Oh man, I mean it's it's everything. I mean you got the middleman between compliance, academics, business office, marketing, Coach Allen. I mean it's 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 a lot. I mean it's I've gotten better at it as the years go along. Luckily, I work for guys like you know Phil Cunningham taught me a lot. Um, Chris Crider was super organized. Learned a lot from him. Learned a lot of tools along the way. Um, but it's just a matter of, I mean, it, it ain't hard. Anybody can do it. It's just a matter of following up. So, you know, the biggest I challenge, I think, the biggest challenge, I think, is just balancing your time. Um, when the season hits, you know, we got a lot we have to do in terms of scouting. and Being able to balance those day-to-day -day challenges with, you know, still being able to do your prep work for future opponents, like, that's the biggest thing. <clears throat> that's when it gets really hard. Now, Mike, give them, give them a little – I mean, if you want to, I mean to put you on the spot. But Mike stays organized like a pro. I mean, he you do a lot with not only s scheduling out your day ahead of time, but then how you – monitoring and charting how you've spent your time after the fact. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I was listening to a podcast with George Radley actually, and he inspired me to do this. He was like, uh, you know, you can't actually have priorities as a person, goal-oriented person, and not measure your time because how you spend your time is actually who you are as a person. So, you know, I want to be an assistant coach, want to be a head coach. <clears throat> got to build relationships. I got to recruit, got to scout, learn next to the nose. I also got to do operation stuff. So, everything I do throughout the day in 15-minute increments, I write down in my planner. And at the end of the week, I go back and I track the amount of time I spent doing operations, doing recruiting, doing basketball. And so uh, it was actually George Raveling inspired me to do that. It's a great idea. And um, yeah, I've been doing that for a couple, three years now, actually just writing everything down. Let, let, let me ask you this, all three of y'all. We're going to do a lightning round after this right here. And the lightning round, me and Sir will alternate questions and you'll short answer all of them. Uh, and it'll be basically what every sports talk show does in the world, except cooler because me and Searle are doing it. But before we get to that part, I want to ask uh, one question for all you guys, and I wanted y'all to, to all answer it. Uh, how much interaction during the season do you do with each other? And and it, I know it may change because your roles have changed through the times as ops and assistant, and head high school coach and different places. But, I mean, I would imagine – no more, you know, I, I deal with a lot of former assistants. I'll bounce questions off of, you know, but I don't have a brother or a cousin that's in coaching. Uh, how, how, how good is that? Or, or is it, you know, do you take advantage of it or not? So y'all go ahead and take that over. Yeah. I mean, we talk all the time. Mm -hmm. Our, our communication never stops and it goes well. I mean, basketball is obviously a big part of it, but it goes well beyond basketball. And so, I mean, if there's two people I want to see successful in coaching, I mean, it's these two guys right here. So, I mean, when it comes to – obviously, the season hits, you get caught up doing a bunch of different things, and you know. and uh, But, you know, you're checking scores and checking up and just making sure guys are doing good. I mean, this is Ty's first year – first year in ops. So, you know, talk a lot about that this past year. And, uh, you know, and, and Pat, we didn't talk as much when I was at UNC Asheville. Uh, they beat us by an average of 30 points every time we play. But, uh, so, yeah, screw That's you. Enough. But mm -hmm. I'll talk to you the next year. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I talk to these guys all the time, Corey, and, uh, you know, I want to see him do well. Hey, uh, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to be the young one and have these two as just references for anything. Uh, they always uh, – answer questions that I might have. If I need something, I always give them them. They're the first couple I'll call. Um, but, you know, of course I follow them and want to see them win. And I want to see, I want to see every, I want, I wanted, even when Mike was at UNC Asheville, I wanted them to win every game except the three games where we played them, you know? So um, I want to see these guys do well and, and, and we definitely stay in touch and uh, do our best to support each other. And when it's not basketball season, I think we do a pretty good job, too, of trying to see each other. Yeah, it's not a like – like we – I mean, nowadays, 
a lot of the ways that people keep in touch is with these group chats. And so like, we're in a group chat together with my brother and that is, I didn't, you don't realize that growing up. I don't, you know, a lot of people don't have what the four of us have that we're like, we grew up, me and Mike the same age, Pat and Walk the same age. And we're still, you know, now that we're in our late twenties, thirties, we're all four of us still best friends. That's like a really lucky thing to have. Uh, and for three of us to be following in, you know, our family's uh, profession and, and be coaching is, is just really cool. So yeah, there's no, there's no, no two guys in coaching, obviously that I trust more, but even, even still that I respect more than, than Mike and Pat. I think uh, one of the neat things I saw when you, the year you worked with me, Ty was, uh, you know, your mom and Walker came to a lot of games, obviously. And then your dad made a lot of games, spoke to our team one time. Uh, Mike, I remember came to the game that we hit a game winner at, at the buzzer at, uh, Atlanta Metro. Yeah. He was at the game. I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think Patrick may have even been at that game. I know he was at another one we had at Gordon. But just interesting, you know, that y'all supported each other, you know, that they were supporting you. I saw it, you know. And that's Look, it. yeah, whatever that is, it's in our DNA. Like, we – people ask, like, who's your team? I've never had a sports team. My sports team is always just who – other than the Yankees. My sports team is just who are – like who, who my family's coaching. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's just, we, we grew up like that was the case with granddad. It was the case uh, with uncle Chuck and it's the case with each other. Like mm -hmm. I just, I don't know how to shake it. Ain't no way to shake that. Uh, I, I actually had a conversation with somebody about that. I was watching a Mississippi state football game and I'm like pulling for Mississippi state over, I don't know who they're playing Auburn or something. And someone's like, why are you cheering for Mississippi state? I was like, well, they pay my brother's bills. It's like, why would I right. not? And right. so, you know, growing up, our grandfather, we, we always like, I mean, at least I always hated Maryland because I felt like they did him an injustice. And so we always went to the beach house every summer. It was a family thing. Everybody would go up to the beach house. We spent a week up there. We, we were all crammed into a tiny house and it's 15 of us. But, you know, we always talk trash about Maryland and he'd be like, hold up, hold up, hold up. We're not in this beach house if it weren't for Maryland. <laughs> don't you talk about don't you hate maryland they bought us this house <laughs> hey i'm glad you brought up the beach house my favorite story ty ever told when he worked with me no i mean where this is about to go i'm a huge doug flutie guy i uh, love doug flutie i think he's the epitome of like when people talk about these quarterbacks who don't get jobs and they deserve them i laugh because i always thought he deserved one and he would prove go to Canada and just kept proving everybody wrong until he got one when he was like 40 years old and uh, was just the ultimate competitor. He was like my hero. So one day I'm telling that to Ty and he's like, what? You like Doug Flutie? And I <laughs> love Doug Flutie. And he's looking at me like, what? So then he proceeds to tell me the story that I want, I want y'all to tell it. I don't want That's to. That's Mike's story to tell. All right, go ahead. You better than me, Ty. You tell No, 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 no. Come Look, on. Hold on. I'll set it up. I'll set it up. And then Mike, it, it, Honestly, we, we were like five or six years old, like really little. And so it's kind of become a little convoluted in my head. I can't remember if it was me who was yelling at, but it feels, I'm pretty sure it was Mike. Definitely Mike. It was Mike. Yeah. And he was, we would go out there, granddad would take us down to the playground and we would get, we, I, I don't think they would have let us in the games, but, it, but granddad was sitting there and he's like, let my grandsons play. So they're like, all right, cool. So we're like six years old playing with these men and and Doug Flutie was always out there and he had a full sweater vest, full chest hair. I mean, covering every inch of his facade and it was glistening in the Delaware summer heat. And he threw Mike a backdoor pass and Mike smoked the layup. And he yelled at Mike, come on, don't you want to win? I, Corey, I don't remember this. Corey, I promise, I don't remember. I don't know if it happened. Everybody in my family says it happened. I guess it happened. You blocked it. It was a bad – you were cursed. For that. <laughs> so he's yelling at you like you're one of his receivers in Canada dropping a pass. Yeah. Yeah. 
believe how man the guy was just so angry. He was so angry, and Mike Mike was like Mike was like eighty pounds. <laughs> That's classic. That blew the glistening in the Delaware sun. Really, Tom. Really. <laughs> Great story. All right, Cyril. We'll try to hold it in here after the Doug Flutie Hail Mary uh, memories that we got. <laughs> good, thing, good thing he didn't throw that Hail Mary to Mike. <laughs> and, uh, I would have so, dropped it. <laughs> I <would've> dropped it. <laughs> so, uh, Cyril, you, you want me to start us off or you going to start us off? Let's go this lightning round. And, and all three will answer and try to answer as quick as you can unless you just got a great story then. Feel yeah, free to you you got to expand on it. We've hit on this already, but let's hear the names again. Somebody you've coached with or for that is truly a mentor that you've learned from that, uh, and there's going to be a whole list of them, but can you pick out a name? Somebody that's been a big mentor for you in your coaching career so far. And we'll go, we'll go young to old. Go ahead, Pat. Um, I'll, I'll yeah. go Dustin Kearns. Smart. He's paying you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Good choice. I there can't say Coach K. This may, this may be quick, Cyril. They're going to all name who their bosses are. I go. And, and then add, add something, uh, a saying or a go-to from that person. And, and I'll, I'll give you the example because you used it in an article from, from North Georgia there, Pat. And I used to say it all the time because it was on your granddad's desk. But the, the harder you work, the luckier you get, right? Um, what does Kern say? Does he have a go-to? Oh man, there. he's got a he's got a thousand sayings. Um, uh, not not right off the bat. I, I would say uh, uh, he uh, the what <laughs> he's got he's got a million Mike Young sayings that that are just like just they 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 they, they make sense. But you're like I can't believe you said like one thing he said our our first year at PC we won 11 games. He was like fellas putting lipstick on a pig. Putting lipstick on a pig, just trying to make it look nice. <laughs> I like go. Mike, how about you? Person and a saying they might have used or that stick in your brain. Yeah, I mean, one that sticks sticks out to me that's directed to me personally, uh, probably a couple times a week. It's from Ben Halland. It would, would be the person I should lose, choose, and it would be uh, start a family, quit being a loser. <laughs> <laughs> I. I've actually seen him say that to Mike when I was working their camp one summer. So that's it happens every week. Mike, what are we doing? What are you waiting for? Does it work? Does it not work? Have you got it checked? Are you going to find somebody? You're going to spend your whole life alone. Is that really what you want? Let's get to the bottom of this. Oh, that's great. All right. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, look, so I'll tell you one thing from Corey. Oh, gee. That one thing that I definitely took from Corey because he would always say to him, he or he say a lot of a lot of stuff, but he one of the things he would always say to him was, "I can't wait to send that film into your boss." <laughs> and he, oh, wow. oh, he would always. That was such a brilliant thing to say to an official because you were so deep in his head at that point. He's wondering, hmm, how bad did that look? <laughs> and you used to. He would, you would march up and down the sideline, and I remember you when you would get really mad. You'd get that horse laugh, that fake laugh that you would do to officials when they would when they would do something, and then you would say, "I can't wait to send that film in." So I, I took uh, that's something I took from uh, from one of my mentors. <laughs> I was I was afraid you were going to pick me and say something I said. That's why I knew it was going to get ugly right there. But uh, yeah, right. Too bad, right? <laughs> All right. So I got one here. I'm more of a foodie, so I want to go best place to eat where you currently work. What's what's a restaurant you eat that's around town? And don't say a, a franchise. You know, uh, what's a hole in the wall that you like to eat in uh, in the college town that you're in? <clears throat> Patrick, I, I, I know Oshan, who you coach. I coached here. He he plays up there. He throws out some places every now and then. So so I I got a little uh, inside scouting report. So. Oshans is uh I know the place. It's right next to Harris Teeters. It's a good it's a good spot. I took him there one time. Um can't think of the name right now. But uh Boonshine Brewery. Great food, great beer, uh great atmosphere. It's just an awesome place to be. And they, it's just they do everything local too. So the burgers are like local meat. The ham is from a local place. Like 
it's an awesome spot uh and and the beer is phenomenal i brought the beer back for christmas uh vacation and ty and mike had a couple as well huh beer to go i like this place yeah great. yeah you know where they do the dustin kearns show no uh that's where where do they no they do that at portofino oh. el portofino it's a good spot <laughs> all right mike where, where are we eating at when i when i come over and see a game oh man we're gonna go to the veranda everyone goes there it's what it is okay our team goes there for every meal night before games get you a steak get you some salmon you know it is what it is i'll tell you look, my other my the other restaurant you need to go to in atlanta next time you're there is eats on ponce if you haven't been there you need to go love there. eats because that's yeah. my spot that's my go-to you're the second podcast guest who has picked Eats. I love it. I love going there too. But Travis Williams said Eats was his spot. That's Man. His spot in love Eats. Mm-hmm. Whenever we play Georgia State at Troy, we've been going. They Mike got Coach Cunningham to go to Eats every time they played Georgia State. So that was their that was our night before the game meal. And so Daniel Peace hated it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. I think he just wanted chicken wings. That's all you have to want. Exactly. No wings I, I, Eats. In Atlanta, you got to go six feet under. That's my spot, and that's right near Georgia State. Do y'all, any of y'all ever ate there? No. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah. yeah. Full seafood platter. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like All right, Ty, we're going to Jacksonville. Where are we eating, man? Yeah, wow. big Jacksonville. There's a barbecue place called Cooter Brown. Oh, I already. Oh, yeah, go to Cooter Brown. That's where we'll go. I may ride over this weekend. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great place. I need a picture of this place. Hopefully you yeah, can. I'll send you a picture of it. I don't know how they came up with the name. <laughs> and on to the next question rapidly. Yes. Yeah. Um, of the three, you get to pick one. Who's the best shooter of – actually, you toss your – if Walker gets on the court every once in a while. Um, who's Walker. the best shooter of the right. Titans? Pat? Uh, Mike's probably the best shooter. Mike's the best shooter. It's not even close. And Walker can barely walk and – Walker. Shoot. So yeah, no, it's it's definitely yeah. yeah Mike's the best shooter. Yeah. See, Mike is still loving this podcast. Yeah. Best yeah. Great podcast. His favorite podcast now. Yeah, it's my best. It's the best. Oh, I love it. I love it. You know, a lot of times when guys are in basketball families like you are, sometimes another sport is your family sport because your family's working during basketball. So I say that to say, like, who's that team? Obviously, Ty's mentioned the Yankees, but. Is there a team that your family kind of r- rallies around? And and if, if your I, team is different, say who it is. I don't know if there's a team that we rally around, but there's a sport that we play all the time. We play wiffle ball at the beach. We've played a total of 741 games, and Patrick and Walker have won one game. They won one game. You you wouldn't have believed the celebration. It, it was like they won the Super Bowl. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> he, he, he How is that not playing true? Playing wiffle ball because me and Walker continued to win in our later years. When we caught up to them physically, we started to win more, and so we no longer play it. They just they just gave up on it. I think you need to see if Doug Flutie will come over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they can recruit Hold Doug on. Flutie. You just Patrick, did you just say you guys continuously were winning? You won. A single game. No, we won okay. multiple games, and then y'all cut it out. You're tired of it. You didn't want to play it anymore, dude. You will listen it's to this genre in live. It's the old uh, – Pat, we watched the brother savings and fireworks. They start losing. They start losing. Time. We saw it happen first I feel like I'm at Thanksgiving. That's I can't crazy. believe you will – You're, will you're comfortable telling a lie like that, Patrick? I, listen. Hey, guys, hey, guys, hey, guys, guys, going up. I'm guys, the King Griffey Walker, Jr. Of, of wiffle ball. Oh, oh my. <laughs> guys, growing up, guys, just so you guys get perspective, growing up, we could have a we could have a farting contest and Patrick and Walker would burp and come in second. <laughs> okay. That, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, there's been a life of second place. Ooh. The Buffalo Oh Bills. man. Hey, I'm going first in the podcast, though. <laughs> that is right. That is right. You've been lead off hitter all night. <laughs> All right, Searle, let's go one more piece here and we'll get them out of here. One more. And this is uh, based on the coaching that you've done. Um, you've been around the game a lot. Lefty Grizel inducted into the Hall of Fame. What's a story, a moment, 
either from that or the lead up to that induction, something he said in a speech, something the family talked about. What do you got there? How special was that? Uh, that was an, an amazing moment just to have the whole family there and celebrate with him. I've never seen him happier. He was out on the dance floor and the entire family was out there dancing around him. And the person uh, coordinating the Hall of Fame said there was nobody else that brought more people to it than him. And so that was unbelievable experience. Um, leading up to it, though, the final four, we sat him down in the lobby and John Thompson, uh, Tubby Smith, and a bunch of just legends were coming in to sit down and talk with him. And he's always given us a lot of grief for having facial hair. And John Thompson in that conversation asked Lefty, he goes, you remember that time you grew a goatee because Bill Russell had a goatee and you thought it was going to help you win a championship? <laughs> and I started dying because Ty can attest to this. All he ever asked him to do is shave his beard every single day. And lose weight. <laughs> the best thing about the Hall of Fame is have you watched I'm sure everybody's seen the speech you guys have watched the speech unbelievable I mean it, it's one of the it's one of the best Hall of Fame speeches those speeches are usually just you know droll and boring and uh but his was unbelievable and leading up to it I mean days Wal Walker was the one who was up there before we got there and he was wheeling him around in a wheelchair and taking him everywhere and uh and he uh, walker called me like in a panic two days before the ceremony i was like dude I, I don't think he's gonna be able to do this speech they they he can't read the teleprompter too far away they're they're floating ideas of having him do a pre-recorded speech and then him in uh, going up there he changed it several times of what he wanted on the teleprompter i mean it was a mess and so Walker wheels him out on, onto the stage and he gets on his walker and he, he walks out there. And until he started talking, we had absolutely no idea what he was going to say or how it was going to go. And then as soon as he starts talking, just like he always does, every eye in the room is on him. And it was great. That's awesome, man. It, it was great. One of my favorite pictures from that is, is uh, Patrick Ewing and uh, sitting right behind him is Ty Anderson. Somebody had <laughs> that where it was on screen or something. And I was just like, what in the world? Ty I know. Patrick Ewing. Long way from Waycross. Yeah, yeah, not that far. <laughs> Mike, how about you? One quick memory there from the Hall of Fame. I mean, it was just so good to have our family there together. And it was like it was like being at one of those conference tournaments again and just having yeah. everyone there for like the last time, you know, hopefully not the last time, but in that setting, you know, to have all my cousins, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, I mean, to have everybody there. It was just really special. And like Pat said, when we were all on that dance floor later that night and just to watch my, you know, granddad and, and grandma out there messing around on the dance floor, like, like I'll never, I'll never forget that. And then to watch him give that speech, and like Ty said, we didn't know what was going to happen. We we're all on pins and needles. And he goes up and he starts telling stories. And I, I can, I mean, obviously my granddad is a phenomenal coach, but one of the things that I wish I could take from him more than anything is his ability to tell a story. Yeah. Because, I mean, that guy can tell a story, man. And that's, I mean, he just got up there and started doing what he always does. I, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, man. And, and Daniel, thank you to you, man. I mean, like, People like you, you help them get there, man. If you don't talk about that enough, I know he's not an easy guy to work for, okay, from one ops guy to another. I know it's not easy, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's everyone like you that helps him get there because he did not Absolutely. Make, yeah, that, that's real. And he's particular and he's detailed and he wants things done a certain way. And and uh, I know it's not easy. So thank you, Dan. Hey, I appreciate you saying I enjoyed one of the roles I had was going up to the house and saying, I was picking him up saying, I got to see Joyce every morning. Hey, how you doing? And driving him back and forth for that stretch of time. So you get the, you get some uh, good lefty time in the, in the car. Yeah, but what you're, what you're describing doesn't really do it justice. You drove <laughs> in Atlanta traffic <laughs> from downtown to the suburbs in Duluth, picked him up, drove him back, and then made the same trip in the afternoon. You must have spent six hours in the car. And then back to the office. Oh, and then you got to get back. Yeah, right. Because Phil Cunningham had a lot of stuff for me still yet to do. <laughs> wow.
Wow. That's unbelievable. Hey, and it works, but now that's why he, he makes it all happen and uh, deserves to be in that Hall of Fame like nobody else. And congrats yeah. to him. Congrats to all of you because you're a, the, the family clearly is a huge part of it. Huge part of it. And that's, and that's yeah, I don't know that he would agree with that. <laughs> yeah. If, if anything, we I haven't won enough games or we, our players aren't good enough. So, yeah, we got yeah, to do better. Yeah. But I think it's neat to see the family close. You know, a lot of times you see coaches because it is such a nerve-wracking business and time uh, spent. Sometimes some coaches don't have families involved uh, with them. And uh, not only does he have his immediate family, but he has generations that have stayed with him. And that, that, that says a lot about him and you guys for sure. All right, sir. I think I think that's a, a good spot to wrap it up, man. This has been a great one. We could go for another hour or two. Uh, we might get these guys in trouble, but we probably could. And we always like to give a last uh, last kind of wrap up um, from you guys. Anything you'd like to share or say here as we kind of come to a close, Pat? Uh, just you know, thanks for having us on here. This was a lot of fun. Um, always, you know, good helping you guys out as much as we can. And, it's always good reminiscing on funny stories with the family, but um, we appreciate it. And uh, anything we can do to help you guys along the way, you know, we're always here for you. You already have. Thank you. How about you, Mike? Oh, man, thank you guys for having us. It's been a ton of fun. Always good hanging out, chopping it up. Corey, you keep winning 20 games a year, 25 games. I don't know how many wins you got now, Corey, like 300 something. <laughs> like, oh, hey. Hey, I was there when I was there when he got his uh, when he got his hundredth win at Waycross, and there was somebody in the stands <laughs> that had a sign. Walker was at the game, and the sign said "99 times one equals 100." <laughs> That's junior college math, man. Junior college and South Georgia math didn't work out great. <laughs> But I've, I've started yeah. now. I'm thinking about multiplying and counting wins that way anyway. Yeah, yeah. Could, as long yeah. as you're not multiplying by one, it'll make yeah, it much better. If I can't do it by one, that is true. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, but, Corey, it's great being on here with you. And, Daniel, thank you for connecting, everybody. It's been a lot of fun. Really appreciate it. Good to see you. Got it. Yep. That's it. Love you guys. That was great. All right. All right, sir. We'll close this out, man. I'm glad we had these guys on. Young guys up and coming. This was uh, the past above us. Yeah, <laughs> hear the stories and reminisce. We always toss out the social media, Instagram, Off Beaten Path podcast, or Twitter, Off Beaten Path with the little underscore there. So everybody out there is watching and listening. We appreciate you. Hopefully this has kept you entertained for our show with uh, those following and lefties footsteps, the grandkids. Uh, we're a show that's for those who want to coach, those who used to coach, those who are currently coaching, and for those who follow coaches and those who hire and fire coaches. We hope you, you keep listening and keep watching. I think that's everybody. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I do. Y'all are the great. Y'all are the greatest.